Hello everyone. Good afternoon. This is Shojan Pal. I am presenting my thesis work on this seminar series. So the title of my presentation is about the holographic recognition of the spine surgery. It will create a new era of the spine surgery. So uh, in this presentation, I will go a, to a brief history and background information. Then I will go in detail about development of advanced augmented reality-based spine surgical model. We, we will then look into the experiment which is have been conducted for validation of that model, the result, and then the future direction of this model. So this model was aiming to focus on surgeon's field of vision for a spinal surgery procedure. And in this procedure, we have created a patient-specific spinal surgery model for augmented reality platform. As we know, as a background of the spinal surgery procedure, that the correct placement of pedicle screw is very challenging part because here the neurovascular structures are obscure and it increases the risk of operative error. So in our current practices, we found uh, in our observation that currently, when the surgeons are doing the pedicle screw placement procedure, they are looking into the uh, image facilities which are away from their operative field. So it causes their attention deficit and it requires a higher skill of hand movement coordination. So our observation finds that these current practices increase the risk of operative error. It causes the surgeon's attention drift and disrupts the flow of surgical team. And in case of post case scenario, that pedicle screw misplacement can cause the paralysis of the patient. So our inspiration was integration of HoloLens into the operating room, which will sense the atmosphere and environment of the operating room in our current practices. Like currently, the, when the surgeons are doing a complex procedure, they are looking away from the operative field into the multiple skin projection. And when we will introduce the holographic uh, visual system, then the surgeons will look into the operating field. So uh, what is currently happening when people are trying to integrate the augmented reality into the surgery, they are creating a two-dimensional image recognition model where like image markers are used as a uh, fiducial. And then when the HoloLens is recognizing that image pattern, it is uh, projecting the patient specific hologram there. And when people are working for the fiducial base, uh, they are like inserting multiple fiducials as a uh, into the operative field. And that when the HoloLens is recognizing that fiducials, they are projecting the hologram. So this two dimensional image recognition based integration has some limitations such as it uh, limits the movement of surgeon within his work span area for best augmentation because when uh, it is found in the literature that when the surgeon is moving far away from the image pattern, it will create some kind of error on stabilization of the hologram over the patient's body. So secondly, when we are going into the fiducial marker-based system, 
uh, the error rate and the accuracy measurement comes that it is less accurate than the conventional neuro navigation based method. So, uh, what is the problem statement? The problem statement we found that it is an unmet need to create the reference surgical tool tracking augmented reality system to bring patient specific visualization and guidance into the surgeon's operating area for a spine surgery procedure. So, our objective was at first the creation of a patient specific spine surgery model recognizing surgery tool based model and then we will look into the improvement of accuracy for overlaying hologram into the spinal functional model recognizing the surgical tool and it will set a new standard for spinal fusion surgery where with the movement of the reference surgical tool. So our first principle was development of a spine recognizing hologram. At first, we create the CT scan of the 3D saw bone. That means the 3D saw bone has gone through a standard CT scan procedure. Then we developed a novel algorithm that has been integrated into the Unity engine. And that 3D CT scan model has been mapped into the HoloLens 1. So first principle was application of spine recognizing hologram. So when the HoloLens is directly looking into the spinal functional unit, the 3D model of the spine, it is directly recognizing the spine model and the holographic model is superimposed into the spine model such as here you will look into the video that uh, the participant is looked into the spine model and it is superimposed directly into the spine model. The hologram is directly superimposed into the spine. So our second principle was we are trying to develop a surgical model for spinal surgery procedure. So we are trying to optimize it for the spinal surgery procedure. So our second principle was to create a connection between the reference surgical tool model and our first principle. So a 3D reference tool model of patient tracker has been created with a spherical geometry, such as here in the first picture, you will look that there are some, uh, it's showing the patient marker. So we, are, we have created a 3D model of the patient marker, then, the communication between the reference model and HoloLens 2 has been established with developed novel algorithm. The holograms has been projected into the procedural field of view in relation to the spherical reference body. So in the second principle, we then come into the application of our second principle, which is the application of connection establishment with the reference surgical tool model. The HoloLens is now recognizing the geometry of the spherical reference surgical tool model and the surgical spine model is augmented to the target operative area, maintaining the specific relationship with the surgical reference tool model. So in this video, it will show there is two model because the two hologram is superimposed directly into the two real-time model, the real-time 3D model. So uh, you will find only two model in the video. So here you will see that even when we are moving the uh, reference surgical tool, that specific relationship with the reference surgical tool and the holographic model 
is also being maintained here. So here I am showing a little process follow of this novel model development. At first, we create the virtual object through the CT scan and uh, of the 3D model. Then we developed it. Uh, we developed the surgical model through the use of Unity Mixed Reality Toolkit and C++ programming languages. Then the surgical model is deployed into the Microsoft HoloLens and it creates the real-time augmentation of the surgical model. Now we step a little bit forward into the validation of our model and to measure the accuracy of our model. So in this experimental setup, this novel surgical model has been deployed into the HoloLens one. When we are conducting the experiment, we gazed it at the target reference surgical tool model from a specified target distance, such as 30 centimeter, 60 centimeter, 90 centimeter, 120 centimeter, and 150 centimeter. Then when it is deployed, the mixed reality capture has been taken and it has been analyzed to measure the accuracy of our model. So the first part is the adynamic part where the real-time models are fixed, but the grid board moves and rotating. So in this first part, we have fixed both of the model into the grid board where the scaling is counted. And then the grid board has been moved to take both anterior posterior and lateral view. Secondly, the mixed reality captures has been taken for both view from the above mentioned target distances like 30 centimeter, 60 centimeter, 90, 120 centimeter, and 150 centimeter. And second part was dynamic part where the grid board remains fixed, but we move both of the model into the grid board scale. So initially the model placed into the specific grid of the paper. Then after taking that picture or mixed reality capture of that view, we moved the models into the certain grid. Then the mixed reality captures has been again taken through the HoloLens. So now, we enter into the data analysis. The analysis of the mixed reality captures of holographic computer vision has been established previously in the literature. So positional at first, when we are measuring the positional distance, it has been calculated using a calibrated uh, virtual IC measure software, then placement error and rotational error has been calculated. So if this is the schematic process follow of the experiment, like holographic projection from the target distances, then mixed reality capture taken preserving the experiment condition, analysis of MRCs with calibrated software IC measure two. The positional distance has been calculated for both partial and real-time model in the target axis, and positional error and rotational error has been calculated from three-dimensional distance and cosine formula respectively. So when we are measuring the target, the first picture is showing the measurement of target axis of the holographic model. And second picture is showing the measurement of target axis of the real-time model uh, in the close view. Here is showing that in the second picture, the real time model is a little bit of larger. So, this is a picture of our measurement procedure. And when we are calculation, when we are entered into the calculation of positional error, we use the three dimensional distance formula. And for rotational error, we use the inverse cosine formula. 
So for error rate of our model for the static or aerodynamic part, we found that the placement error comes in the maximum of all axes is 0 0.014 millimeter with an standard deviation of 0 0.017 millimeter. When the maximum rotational error comes 0.89 degree with a standard deviation of 1.65 degree. And in case of dynamic part, the placement error comes 0 0.022 millimeter with a standard deviation of 0 0.017 millimeter. And the rotational error comes 0 0.308 degree with a standard deviation of 0.649 degree among the all axes. So when we are doing the error rate difference analysis, we found that the error rate difference between all of the three axes among the for the placement error and for rotational error for both dynamic and static part of this experiment remains same. It is not statistically significantly causing error rate difference. So the experiment wise error rate has been calculated, which is 0 0.016 952 with confidence interval of 95%. So if we look into the comparative error rate of our novel method and the current practices of integration of holographic procedure, the two-dimensional image recognition based integration comes with error rate of 0 0.06 millimeter. Fiducial recognition based method comes less than or equal to millimeter. And where our novel method comes maximum error rate with 0 0.02 millimeter. So what will be our future direction? The surgical navigation system will be integrated with the reference tool of the model. Then we will create the creation of surgical guidance system. In this model, the augmented reality-based surgical guidance will go through the bone model, cadaveric, and clinical testing of the experiment. So what is our contribution to the knowledge? This is the first ever standalone holographic model to track complex spinal geometry without using any optical tracking system or without using any fiducials or without using any markers. Then we use the recognition of simple geometry of the surgical reference tool placed and in relation to the complex geometry of a target spinal model, the stabilization of the holographic tracking which is validated in our experiment is established even in the space in relation to the reference surgical tool. So these are the references and now I am open to the question and answer section. I would like to introduce Dr. True Taylor and it's been a privilege to have worked with him and now to host him for this uh, combined seminar series. So just a brief overview about Dr. Taylor. Dr. Drew has uh, been a master of many, many trades. He is a co-founder and chief executive officer at Acon Biolabs. He is a biologist and a formal professional athlete. And he has charted many, many courses in science and biology, baseball, steadfast with his career. He has completed his undergraduate degree in, in biology at University of Michigan. And they on went to get his master's. He then completed his PhD at the University of Toronto in Biomedical Engineering. Drew has enjoyed a very successful career in, in minor league uh, professional baseball as a pitcher for both Toronto Blue Jays and Philadelphia Phillies. Though I root for both the teams because I've lived in both the cities. There is a conflict there. So charting parallel paths across both academia, science and professional sports. After his graduation, Drew went on to become the Chief Scientific Officer at Epic capital management and worked around across many flourishing biotech startups. He then floated his own company, which is Acon Biolabs. 
Drew has been featured many a times on CBC Live, Breakfast Television, City TV, the Agenda, Canada AM, CTV News, and uh, has been very much involved with Mars Discovery District and Mars Health Innovation Week and Elevate Tech Fest. He didn't highlight it, but he also had an alternate stint as a movie director, producer, and a writer. And one of his most recognized works, among many of his works, is the movie uh, Our Marriage in Tehran, which has won many, many accolades at the Canadian Screen Awards, including Best Director. With this, I will hand over the podium to Dr. Taylor, so he can tell us the amazing science he does and how he manages to don so many hats. I'm still confused how you managed to do it. <laughs> so maybe you can elaborate me after years of knowing each other that how you managed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a, uh, that's a tough introduction to live up to. Um, thank you. I, I guess the best way I can describe it is maybe that I'm a little bit of a, a jack of all trades, master of none. Hopefully I, I focus on the science more than anything though, because I think we've, uh, we've really got some solid work that's really exciting and can uh, uh, change the lives of many. So hopefully that's, uh, that's the major focus that I, I do well. But yes, I, I've had the very cool, uh, unique experience to have um, you know, some time in sports and then um, got exposed to film and uh, helped out a little bit. My brother actually is full-time in the film industry. So I got to kind of ride his coattails and have some fun there. So um, thank you so much for that. Just to confirm, um, can you see the slides right now? Yes. Yeah. And do you see just one slide or do you see uh, like the whole screen of notes and all I that? I only see one slide. I don't see Perfect. the Perfect. Okay, good. That's, that's fantastic. Um, well, again, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, um, obviously, getting to know you throughout my career. Um, uh, one is a mentor when I was going through some of my early science training and, uh, and you know, keeping in touch over the years and watching uh, all the amazing things that you've been doing. And, and again, you know, some of them uh, in Philadelphia, some of them in Toronto, now in Montreal. Um, so it's, uh, thank you so much for the invitation here. So thank you to, uh, um, you know, all the organizers of the Experimental Surgery Seminar Series, the uh, Injury Repair and Recovery Program and, and McGill University at large. Thank you so much for the, uh, the honor of, of participating in this series. So, um, well, well, we can dive right in. I've got some slides to accompany and, and we can walk through. Unfortunately, my slides are pretty boring. They're mostly science focused, so no movie slides or sports slides, but uh, we can talk about a little bit uh, of that as well. So we're going to talk about regenerative medicine um, today a fair bit. And so it's pretty important to kind of contextualize what regenerative medicine is because it kind of becomes a little bit of a catchphrase in, uh, in news articles and certain things. Um, and really, this is the idea in general that instead of figuring out how to ameliorate symptoms with devices and chemical drugs, we're going to actually regenerate the function of organs and damaged tissues so that at the end of that treatment, you're the same as before that treatment. And that really is the whole goal of regenerative medicine. It's leveraging yourself, your own tissues, your own cells to essentially replace them. Um, very exciting field. And I still think in many ways we're, we're at the, the beginning of the regenerative medicine era. But I got introduced to it quite a long time ago. Um, I was actually in grade seven. Um, and I was very lucky that my father was a physician and uh, I had the amazing, unique opportunity to actually go into an OR and witness a surgery. And so this actually came about because we had a, a massive science fair, the grade seven, seventh grade for any Americans, um, science fair that was going on. And it was, uh, you could choose your own topic, but you had to break down something mechanical and explain how it works, how it came to be, the innovations that have come around it, and then demonstrate its functionality. And so, of course, I, uh, being drawn to medicine and, and the influence of my dad, I chose uh, the total knee arthroplasty. So the arthroplastic implant in, in the knee. Was, I was pretty sure I was the only one at the school that picked that as the, uh, the subject. We had a lot of people that picked the guitar, some other really cool ones. I went with the knee. And what was amazing about that is because I actually got invited into the OR to watch an arthroplastic surgery. Not sure that would happen today, but I'm dating myself this is many years ago. And so it was one of the best days of my life. Um, it was the first time I really actually got to go in and witness what an OR felt and looked like. Um, met the surgeons, met the entire team, um, all of the people coming together to make this happen and got to meet the patient. 
and ultimately that's the the biggest impact um, that on my career was actually meeting that patient and seeing their reaction before, during, and after the surgery. Um, I can remember clear as day, um, going into the room, pushing open the double doors, that smell of iodine and alcohol. Um, it was an amazing, uh, amazing visceral experience for me, scrubbing up. I had to scrub my hands, use a little thing to clean out under my fingernails. Um, and then watching this team of people that was operating in unison, all focused on their own objective and their, their own responsibility but coming together to deliver the best care for this patient. And so this whole assembly and orchestra of people that was going on um, really captivated me and, and enhanced my passion for medicine. Um, and the surgery was, was um, you know, it went on. I, I, I relished every moment of it and, and took in every element of it. Um, and I, I walked away from it knowing and reinforcing that I, I wanted to have a career in medicine. I actually went home and talked to my father after the surgery and um you know, my brother ended up having the same experience as me. He, he went through the same thing to, to witness it. And he talked to both of us and said, well, guys, what do you think? And I said, I'm going to be a doctor for sure. This is totally what I want to do with my career. And uh, my brother had a very different reaction. He sat back and said, I'm thinking maybe lawyer. Um, so he ended up going into film, but he took a very different path. But this drew me into medicine. But the biggest impact was the next day. I, I got to go back for rounds and witness um, that patient. Um, so I went in with the orthopedic surgeon um, uh, to visit that patient, and I watched them stand up out of their bed and greet that physician. Now, I had seen them the day before get brought in in a wheelchair because of, the, of how much pain they were having. And to watch them stand up, um, greet the surgeon, and literally embrace them because they were so thankful because for the first time they woke up and, and they didn't feel that, that agony. Um, that stuck with me. Um, I ended up walking down the hall away from that experience, just, just telling the, this, the surgeon what, what an amazing uh, opportunity and thanking them and how, uh, how impressive everything was and, and, and the results. And they said something that stuck with me. It, um, they said that, you know, as amazing as it is, that patient's fairly young. And unfortunately, these orthoplast orthoplastic implants only last so long. And so we're probably going to see that patient back in 10 or 15 years for revision surgery. Um, and if, so yeah. can you, we can see your presenter mode. Can you make it full, full screen? We, we can see oh. your presenter mode. Okay, let's see if I can. Uh... Let's see if I can redo it. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks for the heads up, Earl. Um, so uh, they said to me, that, you know, we're going to have to end up seeing that patient again. And uh, if they live another 10 or 15 years, they'll need a, another revision surgery. And eventually that patient will be back in the same place because these implants don't last forever. Uh, the bone on metal integration um, is not perfect. Um, and ultimately, what they said is in your lifetime, Drew, and again, I'm in grade seven, they said in your lifetime, what you're going to see is us actually be able to replace those parts with biological parts that integrate perfectly with that body and can be a lifelong solution for that patient. Respond to shear forces and stresses, heal themselves, and really make sure that that patient goes for the rest of their lives with their own functional tissues. Um, and that was my first introduction to what the, the promise of regenerative medicine was. I ended up finishing, you know, going to high school and finishing all of those things, always focused on, uh, on heading off to medical school. I ended up having an amazing opportunity. I played baseball. My father not only was a physician, but he played professional baseball as well. That's a picture of him up behind me, uh, Ron Taylor. And uh, so I definitely followed in his footsteps and, and um, uh, played baseball at a, a very high level all through high school and then uh, ended up having an opportunity to join the Michigan Wolverines and attend the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, um, play baseball for their team, and also uh, enter their biology department. And so I did my undergraduate work there. Um, I was very lucky that I, I worked pretty hard and, and ended up while I was on scholarship at the University of Michigan also finishing my master's. 
And so I spent um, uh, four years there and was ready and, and, and uh, going to set off and, and continue my education in Michigan in medical school. Um, and it, of course, uh, you know, had a little bit of a monkey wrench thrown into that plan when uh, I ended up getting offered a contract to play professionally with the Toronto Blue Jays. Pretty cool conundrum. Um, and uh, I, I had some pretty uh, awesome role models, including my father that had done both. And, and so I ended up deferring my acceptance to medical school to have the opportunity to go and try, try uh, professional baseball. I had a great first year, so I ended up having to give up my spot because I returned. I figured that uh, this was my one chance to uh, to see if I can make it into the uh, major leagues, but I will be able to go back to medical school. Um, so I ended up playing for a number of years with the Toronto Blue Jays and then the Philadelphia Phillies in the minor leagues. Um, and unfortunately, I had a shoulder injury. Um, I ended up tearing my labrum and having uh, some damage to my supraspinatus, and it uh, made me going uh, go from throwing fairly hard to... Uh, just okay. And so that probably capped my opportunity to continue to uh, progress in, in professional baseball. But I, uh, I held on for a little while, had some great years, and it was a wonderful experience. What I did do that was, was actually a pretty good decision was when I ended up deferring my acceptance to medical school. First, I tried to see if they would let me do medical school and play baseball at the same time. And of course, they told me there's, there's no, no chance of that happening. So I had to pick. Um, what I did do, though, is I quickly applied to PhD programs. And uh, I applied to Michigan, Michigan State, and University of Toronto. And I was, uh, uh, I was very grateful when uh, telling them my plan um, to attend school full time, but also play professional baseball. Uh, I was very grateful that um, it wasn't Michigan and it wasn't Michigan State, but the University of Toronto um, said if I can find a supervisor that would be supportive of that plan, that they would support my application. Um, and accept me. So it was, uh, it was a pretty cool opportunity for me. I was a full-time PhD student at the University of Toronto. I do all of my research and hands-on work in the off seasons. And then I'd be gone for about eight, nine months of the year playing, uh, playing baseball. It worked out very well. There's a couple of, uh, of periods of time where I had to fly back um, you know, do some day, day flights in and out of Toronto to write an exam that needed to be in person. Um, but it was, uh, it was an amazing opportunity to make sure that I was maintaining focus on my academic and, and professional career while also having this opportunity to play professional athletics. Um, professional athletics, at some point, everybody has to hang up the cleats or the helmet or the bat or the ball. And uh, that came for me a little bit earlier than I would have hoped. But at the same time, I ended up being able to, to come back and, and continue my PhD full time and finish that up. Uh, my focus during my PhD was on regenerative medicine. And it was really because of that experience in grade seven that I wanted to focus on this. And so I was very grateful to work through the University of Toronto and Mount Sinai Hospital in the biomedical uh, uh, skeletal tissues engineering team. And so my role going into that group was to take some animal studies that had shown some great success in being able to regenerate cartilage tissue in vitro and translate that model into human cells. So it's no small feat, um, was fraught with some, some really interesting challenges. But during that process, I ended up um, learning a lot about what regenerative medicine is and what the future holds. And so regenerative medicine really has a, has, has a, a big opportunity. And that's that every 30 seconds, a patient dies from a disease that could be treated with tissue replacement. So my experience in looking at orthopedics is really about quality of life and functionality and pain management. But ultimately, when you're thinking about regenerating the heart, the kidney, the liver, these are opportunities to really save a human life. Unfortunately, either due to organ failure or cellular failure, that if there were a replacement for, um, we could do something about. While there isn't that opportunity, we lose somebody every 30 seconds. And it's really all coming to a head because of these advancements in regenerative medicine. Um, stem cell therapies, gene therapies, 3D bioprinting and tissue engineering, all of these things are coming together to paint a, a picture of a future where we are able to actually create replacement cells, tissues, components, and correct disease at the genetic level um, before we really see those, those symptoms progress to a point where they're life-threatening. Now you may sit back and ask, well, look, at it's been uh, a long time since we've heard of stem cell therapies. What's happening? And I don't know how many people know uh, uh, this picture, but this is the Wright brothers celebrating the first flight. This actually happened in the early 1900s, and that flight ended up traveling just over 100 feet. 
It was a huge success, a landmark that is celebrated still to this day. But still, from this moment, it still took over four decades before the first airplane carrying a passenger crossed the Atlantic Ocean and actually delivered on a commercial promise of delivering value to a person, being able to transport them across an ocean. That's a long time. And what it really was is the development of additional tool, tools around aerodynamics and the propeller engine and other things that allowed them to accomplish that leap forward. And really stem cells is no different. We've known about them for a long time, but we haven't had the tools and the description and the qualifications around them and the understanding to leverage them properly to actually restore human function. And what I'm excited about is we actually are now seeing in this last decade, the tools around stem cells emerge so that we can actually harness their potential and leverage them to help humans in the same way that it took decades uh, from the Wright brothers invention to see human benefit. Uh, we're, st we're really at that precipice where we're going to see people benefiting from stem cells today. And it's really because, like I said, we now have the tools needed to treat any disease. That's a really bold statement, but it's absolutely true. If we look at some of the things that have come to light, we have iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, the ability to take an adult somatic cell, first done in a skin cell, and revert it all the way back to behaving like that magic moment when sperm meets egg and you have a, a embryonic stem cell. And these induced pluripotent stem cells are able to become any cell in the body. Um, really circumvented two huge hurdles in tissue engineering, which is having the right cell source that we need of the tissue we're trying to help, as well as the volume of cells that are required to actually create a benefit for that patient. But now we can take a skin cell, turn it into an iPSC, and, and make any number really of, of cells that are needed. If you need a billion cells, you can get that iPSC to re replicate and create as many of the, the, the cells that you were required. This was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2012. It was only discovered really first published in 2008. It's actually the fastest turnaround time of a Nobel Prize awarded in all of human history. And it's because it's, it's that revolutionary to what we're able to do. And I'm sure most of you have, have heard about CRISPR, if not all of you, many, many times over. Um, CRISPR is, is cut and paste for the human genome. And ultimately this now gives us the ability to go in and actually make changes at the genetic level to really eliminate disease before it even starts. These two things combined really allow us to have a cell source used uh, in any of these tissue engineering applications, but also make modifications to those cells at the genetic level to edit out disease so that you can actually repair those cells before you recreate the tissues to, to replace any disease or damage. Um, Again, this has already won the Nobel Prize in 2020. Took a little bit longer to win the Nobel Prize, and I think mostly that was due to uh, some uh, questions about who to award it to and who to include, um, which there's some fantastic, uh, there's a fantastic book that I suggest people read if, if they want to dive into that story. It's very motivating uh, for scientists. Um, we, like I said, we're on this, this precipice where we are seeing this amazing change and explosion in the applications of these technologies. And Nature um, published a, a report just in 2020 on the explosion in the space. And what we have now seen is there's over 8,000 trials using cell and gene-based studies uh, taking place worldwide. Um, if you go back to when I started my career, this number would have been in the dozens. So it is really a, an exceptional moment where we see this, this massive exponential increase in the amount of work and attention on leveraging these technologies for human benefit. Um, and it's coming quickly. And so if we look at the history of just how long these clinical trials take to come about, we already have 30,000 people that are registered in cell-based clinical trials across North America. Uh, but some of these things are already through uh, clinical phases, like, like engineering of the bladder, which is being done at Wake Forest University, uh, engineering of skin to treat um, burn victims um, here uh, at, at SickKids Hospital. Um, we are seeing this moment where in the next 10 years, based on the historic timelines of these clinical trials taking place and looking at where these ones are starting, uh, we are gonna see some big check marks next to a lot of these, these treatments that they are now accessible, available and in full use. Um, so I think we're about to witness in our lifetimes a pretty uh, incredible moment in, in healthcare. Um, it's also happening head to toe. Um, 
these therapies are, are approaching all sorts of, of different areas. This is just a very small spattering of some of the applications of skin cells. So if we take a small sample of skin cells, which can be done minimally invasively or non-invasively, um, you're able to regenerate and create applications right now that are in clinical trials for anti-aging and skin rejuvenation, uh, leg ulcers, um, as well as burn victims, reconstructive surgery for skin after, after those severe burns, uh, even heart disease, stem cells that are located in the hair follicle are being used to differentiate into cardiac muscle cells. Um, you can create significant quantities of them to, uh, to generate patches to repair uh, infarcts. Um, and then uh, obviously one of the, uh, the big topics in a very big industry, but hair loss, not quite life-saving, but certainly important to some. And, uh, and there's some massive leap forwards and some huge companies that are emerging from the U.S. right now in engineering hair follicles in a dish. Um, so amazing applications of, of cells. And again, a lot of the things that we're seeing emerge first are superficial. Right. And I don't mean in the quality of, of the work or in the importance of it. I mean, superficial on our bodies, focusing on the skin because it's accessible. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of those applications happen there first, like aging, like, like ulcers, like burn victims and like hair loss. The problem, and this is a big, big problem, is that we have the possibility of generations that are alive today missing out on all of these advancements. That would be horrible. Uh, and it's because of one simple age old truth. We get older. Every day that goes by, our cells are becoming a poor resource for ourselves. Our telomeres are shortening, free radical damage is persisting, DNA mutations are accumulating. There's studies that have shown the amount of D DNA mutations that we experience doubles every decade of life. Protein aggregates accumulate and clog up cellular machinery and make cells less efficient. And we have cellular atrophy, where the actual size of our cells um, or the size of our tissues decreases. And so we end up having uh, deficiencies in those tissues and, and loss of elasticity. We see that with wrinkles as we age in our skin first, but really that's happening in every organ and every tissue structure in our bodies. These are, are pretty, th these are things that we have accepted, right? These are things that we have just kind of said, okay, it's just a part of life, but ultimately the greatest risk to your own mortality is your age. Uh, your greatest risk to developing a disease is your age. And so we have to be thinking about these age-related illnesses as something that we want to try to combat and that we want to try to avoid uh, when we think about actually leveraging our own cells to treat ourselves. Because this is not uh, the world of assembling purified compounds for a pharmaceutical. Uh, we are now dependent on a starting material that is a cell. And if we're taking your own cells to generate that therapy, that therapy inherently is only going to be as powerful or as healthy or deliver as much health as the quality of those cells that we have access to at that time. And so really we need to be thinking about this in advance. And so for, for most people on this call, you guys are, are super young and probably haven't felt the aches and pains of getting out of bed in the morning that creep up on you as you get older like me. Um, but ultimately, uh, they will catch up to you and, and you will not feel uh, uh, quite as, as spry as you used to. And ultimately, we really need to be thinking ahead of that curve and making sure that we are intercepting ourselves and locking in a starting material for ourselves when we our cellular health is at its absolute highest and our incidence of disease is at its lowest. It's not a very new concept. People have been thinking about preservation of materials and cells for a very long time. Um, but now within striking distance of literally saving lives by leveraging your own cells, it's now more important than ever um, to take action so that you actually have the opportunity to receive them. All of these hallmarks of aging that we touched upon um, really accumulate to make our cells a, a poor therapeutic resource. And so for us, um, we want to get ahead of all of these, um, the incidence in cancer and uh, combined with, with genetic mutations that we experience, elastic, elasticity, telomeres decreasing, the atrophy that we experience in our cells. We also see a drop off um, pretty much uh, arithmetically throughout life um, once you get through your 20s, um, which even takes a further dive sometime in between 65 and 75, depending on the individual, where your amount of progenitor cells and adult stem cells um, really just start to drop off. Um, so these are inflection points that we need to be thinking about and really driving action as, as early as possible. And that's exactly what ACORN's mission is to try to do. 
Um, Acorn uh, has a uh, opportunity for people to take advantage of locking in their cellular health today. Uh, we do that in a very simple way. Um, it is not dipping yourself in liquid nitrogen and freezing yourself like many people think Walt Disney is. Um, you can see in a cryogenic tank, that one contains Walt Disney. Um, it's the obvious one with the Mickey Mouse. Um, I believe that it's actually a, a myth, not true. But when we talk about cryogenics and cryonics specifically, everybody thinks about these massive tanks of people that have been frozen away like Ted Williams. Um, and that's not at all what we do. We are thinking about taking a very small sample of your cells and locking in those cells. With the technologies and tools we have today and being able to culture out those cells and replicate them and create stem cell lines, induce pluripotent stem cell lines for an individual, a sample of adult somatic cells is what we need to be able to leverage these in the future. ACORN has developed a couple of key pieces of technology to allow us to deliver on this promise. And ultimately, it's an ability to make cells last longer after we take that sample. Um, one of the biggest problems when you take a biological sample is it starts to degrade immediately as soon as it leaves your human, the human body. And so for us, what we've been really excited about doing is developing a transport medium um, that is now patented and allows us to preserve those cells and keep them alive and viable during the transportation step, where we take those cells essentially in between harvesting from the patient uh, to our lab in uh, Toronto General Hospital, where they are actually cryogenically preserved. We also complemented that with a kit um, that allows us to maintain internal temperatures with a very small form factor up to three days of between two and eight degrees Celsius, which is the optimal temperature for our media to operate and to keep those cells in a quiescent state. Um, so really excited for this. And, and really what this allows is the scalable opportunity to bank cells. Prior to this, you'd have to drill into your iliac crest to harvest bone marrow, or um, when you're going in for liposuction surgery, you can take some extra cells um, during that process. Um, this is, is the opportunity to actually deliver it remotely where you're not in a surgical suite right next to a cryogenic suite. And we've packaged it together in a nice sleek kit um, that can, uh, has all the contents that you need to actually do this. Um, Anybody at home can actually easily access their own cells. And I'll get into how we can actually accomplish that. And right now, um, we've got a number of partners that do this with trained nurses or technicians at clinics. Um, and really, this is this is an opportunity with an appoint uh, with a quick appointment and no invasive procedures. Um, lock in your cellular health at that very moment. Um, and have those cells stored at negative 190 degrees Celsius where they don't age, they don't accumulate damage, and they are literally frozen in time for you to leverage into the future. We do this by focusing on the hair follicle. Hair follicle is an amazing organelle, which we'll get into in a little bit, but ultimately it is the perfect non-invasive source of, of accessing cells. By plucking a follicle, you, that tip, that white part at the end of your hair has thousands of viable cells, uh, including very high populations of adult stem cells. And so this really has the opportunity to replace the invasive procedures that you would only do at the time of need, like drilling into a crust for bone marrow or harvesting atipocytes. Um, there's also some really clear advantages of the hair follicle, which I'm excited to share with you when we get into the some of the science that we've done because I know with uh, all the scientists on this call you guys would love to see some actual graphs and things not just pretty pictures um, but what is really exciting is our technology allows us to be delivered through the mail and we've done exactly that we've actually taken samples with our kit and our media in Vancouver packaged those ship them across the country to Toronto through regular mail channels like FedEx and have them arrive at the hospital safe and alive and viable. We confirm that through staining and confocal microscopy and analysis for, for viability. Um, and then we process those cells for cryogenics. We've since then waited time and pulled those cells out of cryogenics and shown that we can culture out those cells, which I'll get into some of the amazing work that our science team has accomplished. Firstly, the hair follicle still amazes me. Um, I, it just feels like this was designed specifically for us to be able to access our own cells non-invasively. I'm sure everybody here has plucked a wild eyebrow or something that I certainly have. Um, it's non-painful, non-invasive, and yet you can access a rich population of cells that are present inside the follicle. Um, not only that, but you have multiple germ layers. 
because of the keratinocytes, part of the ectoderm, as well as the fibroblasts that are present, part of the mesoderm, you end up having um, all of these different, uh, these two different germ layers that are present that you can access, including a very rich population of adult stem cells that have proven, have proven out to be quite powerful. These, these characterizes HAP cells, hair follicle associated stem cells. They alone in, in work that has been recently published have been able to be differentiated into cardiac and neuronal cell lineages without reprogramming. Truly remarkable uh, multipotent cells. It's interesting, you don't hear about it a lot, and I certainly didn't until I dove in and looked at this as a viable opportunity years ago when I was in venture capital. Um, but the hair follicle has been the focus for many, many years of work because even early on, the potential of their, their access and the potential of the multiple germ layers has been identified. And so we have seen... Um, a number of works that have continued over the years, finally coming to the actual application where clinical trials are now conducted in humans today, where we're seeing um, cells that have been collected from hair follicles delivering either skin rejuvenation, skin regeneration, um, treatment of various uh, skin diseases, all leveraged in humans now. And so it, it is really at this, this moment in time where it's been building just like the Wright brothers, where you identify these things in their potential years ago. And we're finally getting to a point where we're seeing actual human uh, applications today. Uh, we do this pretty simply just to go over what, what exactly we do. We collect the hair follicles um, uh, through clinic partnerships, as well as ourselves and at UHN. Uh, we analyze those cells um, uh, in our lab to confirm that they made the collection and the, and the travel safely. We then store those cells for you, and then they'll be ready for you into the future to access as you need. We have this uh, fantastic facility. Um, I don't know why some, one of the pictures here isn't loading, but um, either way, we have a fantastic uh, facility that has been uh, built out in ISO certification. So it's a clean room facility at Toronto General Hospital, immediately adjacent to the cryogenic suite, where we actually store those cells uh, long term. If anybody uh, on the call is ever in Toronto and would love to, to join a, uh, a tour of our laboratory, um, please let us know. We'd love to have other scientists come and visit and check it out. Um, we've talked a little bit about the ideal source of, of these cells for regenerative medicine. Um, and you can see some of the staining that we've done on these cells to identify the multiple germ layers, the fact that there are multipotent cells present, as well as the bulge reason of the fo follicle, which has some amazing um, epithelial stem cells that are present that uh, are rich in, in both staining of CD200 and CD35. Um, so this is where a lot of our science is focused on is really how can we very easily and quickly replicate cell lines for individuals to create them the opportunity to take advantage of any of these possibilities into the future um, by looking at, uh, at multiple opportunities to differentiate these down multiple lineages. Um, looks like um, Avi raised your hand. You wanna ask a question? Y yes, but I'm gonna wait uh, until the end of the presentation. Okay, I just sure, want to sure. Be first in the line. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Please continue. Yeah, you're first. I, I will remember yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so a little bit about uh, what we've done here. Um, we've been able to, like I said, uh, collect transport in our media and our kit, and then preserved through our, our process. And what we've been able to demonstrate is that through that journey, in the, the media that we have engineered, as well as a cryo preservation media, we're able to retain these key keratinocyte and stem cell markers. So we're not seeing confirmation, conformational changes in those cells um, at the molecular level and at the genetic level, which is extremely exciting. Uh, on top of that, those markers that are present in those HAP cells that um, actually demonstrate some level of multipotency or pluripotency, we actually see the main, main maintaining of the levels of, of obviously OCT4 SOX2, uh, NANOG, the, the things that you would see as the hallmarks of the IPSC generation and reprogramming. So really exciting to show that we are not inducing massive changes into the cells through this process, and we're able to actually preserve and lock in the cell's potential. Um, this is a video, oh, I don't know if it will play, might not, oh, that's too bad. 
Um, anyway, um, take my word for it. This is in culture over a 10 day time lapse and you see cells just explode in culture off this follicle. So what we've developed is a procedure and a protocol that allows us to seed these um, hair follicles onto coated plates um, that allow us to actually outgrow those cells and create this, this upscale possibility of creating cells that can then be harvested off of that service and, and, and create an aqueous uh, cell solution that can be then leveraged during different processes, including reprogramming. Um, really, uh, really um, amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, the video doesn't look like it wants to play, but maybe does that work? No. Maybe somewhere. just click on the, the slide, sometime it works. Yeah, no, it just keeps going to the next right. slide, unfortunately. But anyway, well, um, you can go on my Instagram. I'm pretty sure we put a post to that video on my Instagram. So uh, Dr. Drew Taylor, and, uh, and you can find, uh, find that video. I apologize. I didn't plan that to drive you to my Instagram page, but please follow me. <laughs> um, so this is really, really exciting, though. What this means is from a single hair follicle, we're able to create 1 to 1.5 million cells using a feeder-free system. So we're not complicating it with any other cell lines. And that, um, that amount of, of upscale of, from the follicle is able to be induced into pluripotency through reprogramming. So from one hair follicle, we have in our lab generated a personalized iPSC line for a patient. Um, that's, that's where I, I feel we are really seeing the immense possibilities of this, this regenerative medicine revolution, where we can take a one plucked hair follicle and theoretically demonstrate how we can take that cell line into a cell that is capable of then being induced into uh, or reprogrammed and then put into whatever cell type um, we feel and hopefully one day regrow someone a kidney on demand. So to drive forward after this step of being able to create these iPSC lines from a single hair follicle, and again, we don't only collect one hair follicle from patients, we collect multiple of them. We are, are very big on redundancy at, uh, at ACORN. Uh, but we've got a number of really interesting research partnerships that we've established. Uh, one of them, which I'll announce uh, pretty shortly here, that includes your fine institution. Um, but uh, we've got one going on with the NRC where they're using the keratinocytes that we have in our cell populations to um, uh, to model the blood-brain barrier, some of the exciting work that they've done in that field. The NRC is a leader in that space. Uh, University of Toronto, um, we've got an ongoing research project where we're actually at scale generating uh, high-quality iPSC cell lines um, from obviously our non-invasive accessible tissue source. And then with Mount Sinai Hospital, those cell lines that are being derived with that U of T partnership are then going to continue on and be induced into kidney cells and pancreatic organoids to show those first steps into creating actual cell types that could lead to uh, regenerative medicine therapeutics in the future um, from that very same patient. Uh, really exciting work that, that all continue to show the different avenues that you can go with this. It really is never ending. Um, and when I say never ending, I mean it. Um, people are working on everything, including uh, this really interesting study of, of one of the scientists we correspond with. Um, this is work that they did on rejuvenation of skin. And so it was really interesting because uh, um, the Daily Mail, which, uh, which is not quite uh, cell or nature, uh, or the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, thought this was so compelling when this publication came out that they picked it up and labeled their, their article, Say Bye to Botox. Uh, skin cells can be banked and then used later in life to iron out wrinkles. Um, Dr. Kei Cheng's work at uh, UNC has shown that by reintroducing younger skin cells subdermally, you're able to actually create younger looking skin reduce wrinkles and even re reverse sun damage. So um, really amazing work in a fairly big industry, um, uh, skincare, um, but we're seeing these things actually start to enter human use for, for a variety of different uh, um, uses. And one thing that we do at Acorn is we don't want somebody to use up their sample at Acorn to rejuvenate their skin. And then 30 years, maybe their priorities change and they need a new kidney. Um, and so we always keep cells uh, banked down and only take portions out. We all all quat every patient sample to make sure that they have multiple vials that they can draw upon. 
So this is, this is where it gets into a little bit of, about the future. And this is where Acorn is really excited about the possibilities of working with, uh, you know, amazing young, bright scientists like everybody on this call. Uh, but it's really the intersection of diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, and this is where I see Acorn really having a role in, in creating the healthcare that we want to deliver tomorrow to patients. And the first area really of integration that we've seen is, is genetics. Um, like I said, Acorn is harvesting live cells. We don't need live cells necessarily to run genetics, but everything beyond genetics as well. And so as these kind of consumer healthcare tests continue to catch speed, um, 23andMe and Ancestry.com have certainly garnered a tremendous amount of attention uh, from the general population. And I think the demand that we're seeing now is to push into territories where we're actually delivering health actionable data so that people can can really start to think about personalizing their healthcare and their medicine. Now, genetics is powerful. It's extremely powerful. I don't know if anybody knows who this person is, but they're the Golden State Killer. They were actually identified decades after their, their serial killer spree um, because one of their family members took one of those consumer genetics tests. And in that database, they were able to identify that the Golden State Killer was related to that individual that took a genetic test. And so what we're seeing is a lot of the real world applications right now be used for, you know, putting bad guys behind bars, identifying who your relatives are and who you're, you're related to. But the next wave of what we're going to see an explosion around is actually health actionable data. And I think that one of those drivers is, is, really the migration away from microarray analysis into areas of whole genome sequencing. And this is driven by economics. Uh, we've seen this massive um, decline in the cost to whole genome sequence, where we're able to actually uh, deliver a whole genome sequence for $650 Canadian. Um, and that's a far cry from in 1998, where an estimated $750 million was spent during the, the Human Genome Project to decode the first genome. Already there are over 1,200 diseases with known genetic links. We need to deliver these right now diagnostically, which means there needs to be oversight and approvals from Health Canada and the FDA, as it should be. But as those continue to come out, you'll be able to access these things because you don't need to go into a hospital to get this done. The emergence of telemedicine and at-home kits has made this extremely accessible and cost-efficient. Um, and really, when you compare the amount of data that is now being able to be derived for $650. As an example, 23andMe right now, I think depending on which kit you do, costs between $100 and $250. Well, for $650, you can get 10,000 times the amount of data. Now, right now, like I said, some of that data is really superficial. It's about diet, it's about integrating blood pressure, it's about you know how our propensities for tissue damage and skin and sun damage are, maybe our risks for heart disease, caffeine sensitivity, markers for psoriasis, dry skin and eczema. But these are, are really what is being delivered on today that you can actually create some kind of benefit in your lifestyle um, so that you can stave off some of these conditions or you can compensate for some of the deficiencies that you may have by actually ingesting a higher amount of vitamin C that your body may require. Um, identifying if you actually are allergic to, uh, to gluten. Not many people actually are, but, um, uh, but you can actually do a test for that. And so more and more of these things are actually getting layered in daily. And as we start to think about deeper and deeper disease models that we are driving genetic risks from, we're looking at actually starting to create a, a conformational change in how we think about healthcare. It's been very reactionary, right? We get sick, we do something about it, but not before we get sick. That's when we go see the doctor is when there's something wrong. And really with the power of being able to access genetics and the information about ourselves so that we can actually make better decisions for maintaining our health because we know our, our weaknesses, we know our deficiencies and we know our strengths. And then actually listening to that advice and modifying our individual behaviors, we actually start to be able to influence more and more of the risk factors to premature death, which is what this graph represents. The 20% of social environmental factors that, that uh, lead to our risk of mortality, those are very difficult to approach. Those are more social um, and, and societal 
issues and economic differences between people just where and when you were born. Um, but what we have and what we've seen technology in, in the space that we're working in in health sciences really start to drive forward is the ability to understand our genetics and how they impact our risks and then actually modulate our individual behaviors. We really are a motivated people when we have data and information. We rarely make decisions until we actually see the results and the implications of things. And by delivering that to, to patients, we have a much better chance of them actually following health patterns and developing um, practices that lead to a better health. And it all happens before we get sick. And so right now, unfortunately, it's pretty dramatic and it's probably my most depressing slide in this whole deck. Um, only 10% of our risk factors to our own mortality and, and timeline are actually influenced by healthcare. But that's expanding, and healthcare is now covering a lot more ground. So it is a very exciting future where, where we see ourselves really take more and more ownership over our health earlier and earlier in our lives. And I think the biggest thing that we're going to have to see a shift in, in society, just personally here, is I certainly was like this when I was younger. I felt invincible. And I wish that in my 20s, I had started to think about these things um, way ahead of time. Um, and I think that the communication this to the youngest generation and the younger generations, um, like many of you on the call, is extremely important. We have this amazing access, the living human cell. And I, understand, I underlined living because that's important. These kits that we're looking at genetics right now um, take dead cells. Um, when we actually capture live cells, especially when it's in a way like it's non-invasive, like through the hair follicle, we now have the ability to dive into more layers beyond just genetics. It starts to unlock the ability to look at elements that you need a live cell to actually analyze. Things like metabolomics, proteinomics, transcriptomics. We're already seeing a lot of talk around epigenomics. So these areas now, this multi-omics approach is really painting the future where we are gonna be diagnosing disease before the first symptom. And then having access to your cells and starting material that is gonna be beneficial in regenerative medicine, we're gonna be able to eliminate it before you ever get sick. That is what I believe the future of healthcare looks like. And uh, we're very excited to hopefully be playing a, a small and humble role in it. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. So I think that there's a few moments in history where as a human race, we've had to think about things in the future. Uh, one of those instances um, uh, where technology was moving extremely fast, but people had to make a decision before it was fully there, was actually around genetics. And it was actually the police departments where that, that decision fell upon. When, uh, in the 70s, if you took a biological sample from a crime scene, you were able to identify a number of, of things. You could identify their blood types, and some characteristics about them, but we didn't have DNA technology that allowed us to actually identify the person. And so police departments knew about the work around DNA. They knew about the characterization. They knew the technology was advancing around that space and people were working on it, but they had to make a decision. Do they take the sample, identify the blood type, and then throw it away. And at least they'd be able to eliminate suspects, but not identify a suspect. Or do they actually save it with the promise that technology will continue to develop and ultimately they'll be able to leverage those samples again for more detailed information. And many departments decided not to. Uh, and some invested in cold chain so storage and actually preserved those samples and made sure that they were kept at the right temperatures to preserve uh, that material. And ultimately, you know, when you, they went back and they pulled those samples out after DNA technology was first used in the first course case, actually in London, uh, in I think 1984, all the groups that had stored samples were able to go back to those, those freezers, pull them out and identify hundreds of, of suspects and murderers and, and all sorts of, of terrible crimes. They were actually able to identify uh, the suspect and bring justice, um, but only the groups that actually invested in storing that, that those cells and made sure that they were actually preserved. That's the side of history I want to be on, and especially when it comes to my own health and my children's health. And really, this is this is the why. Uh, what we do at Acorn is we are trying to make sure that we're delivering 
more years to individuals so that they can spend time with family and do the things that they love. Uh, and our best chance of that is making sure that we're prepared for the next generation of technologies that are going to influence our healthcare. And so I'd like to be on the side of history as those, those forensics departments that, that did preserve those cells. And, uh, and really when I, I look at uh, my wife and my kids, you know, heading off to school in the morning and, and the, the mad rush of getting them out the door, we've got three boys at home. Um, you know, that's the motivation every day is to make sure that, that we get more time together and that everybody, every family gets more time together and, and has a chance to avoid disease and damage and, and never end up with the circumstance of them going to their physician and saying, I heard that there's this new therapy uh, that can treat this disease I have and having to hear that, yes, there is, but unfortunately you're not a candidate because you're either too old or too sick and we don't have access to, to the proper starting materials to deliver on it. Um, so that's why we do what we do. There is a, a revolution that is upon us. Um, like iron and steel were to the industrial revolution and like the microchip was to the tech revolution, cells are the driving force of the regenerative medicine revolution. And ultimately, we want to make sure that everybody has their best. Roel, thank you so much for the invitation. That, uh, that's my chat for today, but would love to open it up uh, to some questions. And I know that we've got one that is first in line. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Drew. I will let Ovidio ask the question and uh, I have a couple of questions for you when students are done. Yes, hi. Um, that was very interesting. I will, I have, I, I have actually a layer. Of, I have a deck of questions, but I will just reduce <laughs> them to two. Because, uh, um, um, for example, uh, right now what you're doing, you're basically preserving uh, some of my tissue. But if, and in your pitch, it's and and the company, it's about regenerative medicine revolution, which is absolutely fabulous. And uh, I think the the way to go into approved therapies, uh, this is the way to go. But right now, I uh, my first question is, what real therapies are currently available that are approved by Health Canada? Because I know they have some, but mostly to bone marrow transplant yeah. uh, that are working in uh, hematology topoietic stem cells and those kind of are kind of approved and uh, the rest of the therapies the they are uh, they are labeled as uh, either unapproved uh, therapy which doesn't mean it's it, it, it's not valid it's just not yet uh, 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 it didn't yet went through the whole battery of 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 scrutiny that Health Canada does, uh, and it's a little different from because um, FDA has a different set of battery tests. Mo that's mostly with kind of like embryonic cells from the placenta. And uh, what about the experimental therapies, which is even another layer from the unapproved therapy? Because I have approved therapy, unapproved therapy, and then I have experimental therapy that I uh, that I that we can benefit now. Uh, from those. How successful were you into getting clout in using, uh, in using your samples uh, to be used the, into that? Because uh, that, that will be interesting. And, and I'm seeing this from the perspective of somebody that has uh, the last frozen ovule became my daughter. And we were really looking into this far-fetched science fiction at the time, uh, stem cell embryonic cells, how maybe we can do that. Of course, yeah. it was it was just desperation, but uh, it proved that we didn't do that. So I, I, I have a I have I have a stake into that part. Yes. Now, my yes. second question will be a little bit like a, the devil's advocate here, because right. what you're pitching, it's regenerative medicine is and it's like, hey, would you want to go in heaven? Uh, I, don't, I think that we know the answer that everybody will give to that. Uh, and by heaven can be anything. For example, for me, it's a place with a lot of cheese. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and that will be my heaven. But And it's different for everyone. But um, uh, at the same time, I don't feel comfortable that I will kind of go mad in one day. And because I have a follicle with you and you have my genetic signature, I'll be arrested because my wife just did that. 
so I, 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 I see it as an extremely good pitch for forensic medicine and the police departments. And I think you should do that because there will be some good funding there. But uh, I, 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 I will not pitch that to, to, to somebody that, hey, you want to be young and we can catch you that you did something that right now may not be a crime, but you see the, the volatility of this. Well, I, have, I have to okay. ask, what do, you, what do you do during your spare time? Because if this is a concern for you, then we might be wanting to turn around and ask you some questions. Well, that, that, what I do in my, that, that, that's true. But what I do in my spare time, and that is in the in the chart, is it's my it's my problem. It's yeah. it's my own thing. So yeah. it, it, it's about the ethics of of of. Okay, how sure am I that I'm going? You're going to get my sample, and it will not end with the police because I don't want. It's that. impossible. It doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with us as a company. The Canadian and U.S. governments can subpoena any company. Yeah, for information but but you see, it, it, it's just a, an, an exercise on. Because I I just picked up yeah. on your pitch in, in there. Yeah, I mean, I it's think, about I think the, the ethics bigger... of, of using. Uh, it's about the ethic of using, like, uh, um, uh, specimens picked from for a certain purpose, and they are repurposed now. Yeah, I I, I don't actually look at it as an issue. Um, personally, one, I'm not a murderer, so that's always a good thing, right? Where I'm not actually concerned about any implications of, of a criminal activity and me getting caught. But I think more importantly is um, our genetics will be part of standard of care in the future. So there will be nobody, right? I, Unless I, I, you are completely off the yeah. grid, right? I, I, and so I, I, if you are a normal, regular part of society, then this information will be accessible and out there and it will become the norm in the same way that we leave our fingerprints all over the internet and Facebook has all our data. Unfortunately, our genetics is going to be so important to preserving our health and understanding ourselves that it will be standard of care for individuals and there will be far more good that will come of it than any bad. Um, as far as, as your first question around what has been done, as an example, using uh, skin cells, um, uh, sheets of skin were created and actually 24 patients at SickKids Hospital have been treated by growing out them sheets of skin for after okay. severe burns. Um, we have a number of trials that are going on in the US and I'm not talking preclinical, clinical trials with registered right, patients that have received right, therapies. Yeah. This is for hair loss, skin rejuvenation, sun damage, um, skin discoloration, um, yep. Uh, hair follicle regeneration. Um, then you have venous leg ulcers, uh, diabetic foot ulcers. So those are just the skin things. So no, right. yeah. no transfection, no, no induced pluripotency. Those are the things that we'll see first, because That's if awesome. we are if we are starting to reprogram those cells or conformationally change them, it's not you know a minimally manipulated cell line anymore. We're actually creating. Um, higher risk factors in that therapy um, when we actually create pluripotent stem cells. So um, there are multiple applications that are being used in humans today. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So for instance, there are 12 patients in North Carolina that have, their bla have had their bladders lab grown and reconstructed and implanted. Full okay. organ. That's impressive. If you weren't in North Carolina, you didn't have access to it because it was done at Wake Forest University, right? So we are seeing a moment where it is starting to get distributed. And ultimately, the best thing that we can do is prepare for that. Now, ACORN may not be for everybody. You have to be future forward and thinking to say, this is something that I want to prepare for and be involved in. But we see right now in Canada, 2.6% of the population bank their umbilical cord, like that question that you had back in the day. Uh, when you had your child and, and your umbilical cord is interesting, right? Like that technology has been around for 30 years. Unfortunately, it's mostly used in donor databases. It's not actually the, the chances of you leveraging. There's no approved therapy of leveraging your own child's cells to treat your own child. It's, it's actually the only approved therapy using umbilical cord that's fully approved is, um, is from a donor, right? And there's specific reasons for that, right? It's leukemia that we treat. And um, leukemia is, it has the genetic inherent conditions that are going to be still part of the cells that you bank for your child. So we look to donors. This is the opportunity of actually taking your own cells and making sure that they're banked so that you can actually leverage them in the future. Um, not, 
not necessarily from from um, uh, you know not having to rely on donor databases whether you're going to find a match you know thousands of people die every year on donor wait lists and if they had their own cells banked they would have been able to to avoid that well in the future when those technologies come okay uh thanks a lot for the question or video uh, thank you question. thank you very much absolutely other questions So Drew, I will ask you a question. I mean, I was more interested about this, the main challenges that you faced when you were floating your company. Like, how was the transition from academia to a startup to having a full-fledged company that is thriving? Because many of these students that we have are in uh, masters in innovation stream, and yeah. one of the exercises is to have a startup, a hypothetical startup, and then make it into reality and have a business pitch and everything. So yeah. what would be your advice to this young buddies, uh, young budding scientists slash entrepreneurs? Like Honestly, yourself? I would say I would say the biggest the biggest um, moment for me was pitching my wife. So I'm, you guys are all young, so I'm sure that maybe some of you, but not everybody, is married yet. You know, we had kids at home, and I had to pitch her because I was j- jumping from a pretty successful career in venture capital and saying that's join a startup where there's no guaranteed salary. There's starting from zero, right? Like, in, and building it. And, and so my first pitch was to my wife of saying like, this is like, I, I can't think of myself doing anything else right now. This is what I want to commit my time and energy to. And it's actually going to take the support of my entire family because it's, uh, you know, there's going to be sacrifices that we have to make as a family to be able to jump into this and, and commit to it. And so that was the first moment. Um, and it's an important moment and it doesn't matter who the individual is, but you're going to have a moment like that. It doesn't matter if you have a family, but it's the moment where you actually step forward without necessarily sure footing under you and saying, I'm going to commit to this because not many part-time startups work out very well. Um, and it takes, uh, probably more than your full time as a job to actually be successful at it. Most startups fail and, and you have to be very committed to getting it done. Um, I think it, you know, my time in venture capital was a great introduction for me to be on that side of the table and evaluating companies and understand which ones were successful, which ones weren't, um, you know, and, uh, and the rationale behind why we made some of the investments we did and try to make sure that we replicate some of those same paths and successes. So that was a great introduction for me. Um, I think that that you can find that. Right. And so ultimately approaching individuals that are more experienced and have gone through some of these these road bumps before, gone through some of those foundational moments of starting up a company before and finding a mentor. They don't have to be an investor at that moment. You might not be ready for investors at that moment, but finding somebody that you can use as a mentor to talk to is extremely important. Founding a company is probably the loneliest thing you will ever do because you're not reporting into anybody. You're only beholden to yourself and you can really only draw motivation from yourself. And so having somebody that you can actually rely on as a mentor to one bounce ideas off, but two sometimes just talk to and actually have a conversation with about some of the challenges that you're facing and, and some of the, the feelings that you're having is really important. And it doesn't have to be somebody that you're asking for money to support the company. It can be somebody that you're, you're tapping in, into a, their experience, which can be even more valuable. Uh, Drew, there is a question from a student Parsa. He's asking, if you don't mind me asking, who are your competitors mainly in the US and how big is the market for regenerative medicine at the moment? Mm. What do you project for the next five to 10 years? Yeah, so, the, the, you know, the industry of regenerative medicine is, is massive, like, you know, billions and billions of dollars, but it's very fragmented and, and separated down into very distinct groups, right? There are groups that are, are very successful at running clinical trials, right? And so these research contract groups are, are able to generate massive revenues. They're not necessarily helping patients today, but they're driving forward the research. And there's a very big market there in regenerative medicine. The biggest kind of consumer side of regenerative medicine has been probably the umbilical cord space, uh, a big umbilical cord company in the U.S. scaled up and just sold for $1.6 billion um, itself. So it, it, there, this is a massive industry. Um, in five to 10 years, 
I think that we are going to start to see regenerative medicine applications commonplace. And, um, you know, probably says a lot about society, but I see it happening in one very specific area of medicine first for two big reasons. One, because the main driver is not the government, right? It's actually out of pocket expenses and it's the world of aesthetic and cosmetic medicine. Because it's out of pocket, people can make the decision to pay for these things themselves, and not have to justify those expenses to, to the government. And, you know, which ultimately it takes more time to go through and actually um, get approvals, go through all of those different things. And it's not approvals around the actual applications of the technology safety wise. It's the approvals for budgeting wise and whether this thing is going to be covered by OHIP, et cetera, right, or, or the equivalent in Quebec. Um, and so when people are paying out of pocket, if it's an approved therapy, they can get it right away. And the world of cos uh, cosmetic and, and um, aesthetic medicine, that's where that happens in Canada. In the U.S., it's a very different story. But in Canada, that's where it's happening, a little bit in sports medicine, but mostly in aesthetics. And so we saw that with PRP. PRP is platelet-rich plasma. And pl platelet-rich plasma, as many of you know, is where we take um, a draw of blood and we spin it down. And we get this rich concentrate of blood plasma that has a high concentration of growth factors, nutrients, platelets, and that can be delivered to a site of injury to incite a better immune and reparative response. It's very dependent on the individual, right? And so there's varied results out there because you're essentially tapping into the health of that individual at that time. But it is really the intro product in regenerative medicine that we've seen reach the marketplace. And we see the applications of PRP increasing by 50% year over year in the last two years. So it's exploding in uses. I think you'd be hard pressed to, to find a out of, product, out of pocket sports clinic or an aesthetics clinic that does not offer it. It's extremely popular um, and people are getting a lot of really positive results from it. And so the idea of reusing your body to heal your body in other areas is already pervasive. Ultimately, now the next extension of that will be leveraging your live cells as opposed to your plasma. And so the first areas that I see this happening is areas we don't have to reprogram the cells, so treating the skin or the hair follicle. And two, in areas where it's out of pocket and you have people that are willing to pay for it. So that's where this explosion will take place first. And we saw the first thing in, with PRP. And now it's used, you know, Tiger Woods, Kobe Bryant, they all had PRP injections when they were injured. Do there is another question from Ms. Kana. Uh, he's asking what skills were most relevant slash transferable to be adapted in research oriented work and your time in the VC world? <laughs> it's a bridge that gap. Um, I think I was pretty lucky. Um, I ended up meeting some individuals that had um, a, a very successful hedge fund venture capital group that wanted to get into healthcare. And so myself and a physician ended up um, joining the group when they launched a series of, of healthcare venture capital funds. And really um, for me, one of the things I think that attracted them to me is that my master's and my PhD were actually in different subjects. So I did my undergrad in um, molecular cellular developmental biology, sorry, my master's in molecular cell developmental biology and then I, at, at Michigan. And then I came back to the University of Toronto and did a PhD in biomedical engineering. So having that, that engineering background combined with the molecular side, um, you know, they felt that I had a, a good idea of being dangerous in may, many spaces of, of, of being able to analyze and do diligence on companies. And I think one of the biggest things that people can do is uh, research drives us into the very specific area of expertise, right? And, you know, when we're thinking about the academic world and the body of knowledge, when you do a PhD, you're just trying to like poke a little note out and, and increase the size of that circle in one direction, very specifically. In venture capital, you don't have that luxury of only being an expert in one space, and so translating the research skills into venture capital, if that's your specific question, uh, versatility and diversity is, is actually the biggest thing that you're going to need. It's not just enough to be a molecular biologist. You also have to be able to look 
at a company that's relying on engineering technologies or programming technologies or, or imaging technologies, right? You have to be diverse enough to actually start to be able to analyze and do diligence and understand if companies have merit quickly. Um, and that's one of the important aspects around, I think, being a scientist that makes that tr transition into venture capital. And one of the biggest things that I can suggest is read. There's so much content out there right now in so many different avenues. And there are some, some great groups out there that are distilling um, uh, some, some very diverse subjects into digestible pieces of, of literature that you can read on your phone. And I, and I think one of the biggest things for me was just constantly trying to stay up to date in multiple areas. And that was a transition for me. Because when I was doing my PhD, it was all about cartilage right? And regeneration of cartilage tissue so specifically, right? Well, one of the first companies that I looked at when I jumped into venture capital was a new diagnostic imaging device for breast cancer. Not a lot to do with cartilage regeneration. So though that, that diversity is very important. Thanks a lot, Drew, for the very engaging talk and uh, all the other make, make friends, right? You want to be able to pick up the phone call and call that breast imaging expert that you connected with and, and say, can I get 15 minutes on a call with you for you to help validate something? Yeah. Keep, make friends and keep friends. Like I call Raul all the time. Raul, I, this is over my head. Can you help me understand this? <laughs> all about networking. Thanks a lot, Drew, for the very engaging talk and uh, the engaging conversation. I'm pretty sure the students learned a lot. And on the behalf of the program, a uh, big note of thanks to you for taking our time from your busy, busy schedule. And you're very uh, grateful for that. My honor, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure um, uh, being part of, uh, of the series. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Drew. Take care. Amazing. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Happy holidays. You too. Talk soon. Talk soon.